All right, welcome to the latest installment of My Sex Bios Fucking Capitalism. I am Pierce Delahunt. A uh, couple of the usual caveats. I am what I call a social emotional leftist, an activist educator. I teach this material, and I am also a member of a variety of positions of privilege and power. All of the proceeds that come from anyone choosing to attend the live discussions of this series will go to My Sex Bio's other staff and their operations. And with that, let's dive right in. This theme is all about polyamory. That's the, the month's theme of my sex bio. So we're going to be looking at the political economy of polyamory. Before we jump into that, let's take a look and just clear some definitions out of the way. We're going to keep this really simple. So we want to understand our root words, take in a little bit of lesson from Schoolhouse Rock. We have the prefixes on the left there, the suffixes on the right. Mono, one, bi, two, poly, many, pan, all. Very simple. It's just a matter of keeping track of them. Amor or amory is love. Gam or gammy is marriage. Gin or gin, depending on how you say it, referring to women. And refers to men. So this is a point I want to make. A lot of people will say polygamy, meaning many marriages, more than one marriage. And they'll really be meaning polygyny, which is more than one woman for every man. And so that's a, just an important distinction to be clear on. Mostly in conversation, you know which one you and your friends are talking about. But if you're reading an academic paper, it's important to be clear on what the writer is actually referring to. Just to get that out of the way. But the actual bulk of what we'll be talking about is the political economy of polyamory or the preposterous passage of private property through progeny and posterity. And in order to understand that, we need to emphasize, I would argue, historical materialism. So that's going to be a focus for uh, this first part here. Now, historical materialism was famously developed by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. There they are, their beautiful faces. I show them young because I think we have this uh, impression that their ideas came fully formed from their old manhood when actually they were developing this as they went along. And I want to give a little more life to the ideas by humanizing, by highlighting the fact that there were humans involved in developing these frameworks. But what do I mean by historical materialism? Really simply, that's just the science of how physical conditions, especially modes of production, influence society over time. So materialism referring to how those material conditions, those physical conditions, especially the modes of production, which is to say, how does society arrange itself and organize itself to produce goods and services that all of society needs? How does that arrangement influence the culture of a society? How does the material affect the cultural? How does the physical affect the ideas and, and uh, values and those kinds of things? So that's the materialism component. And then the historical component is looking at how that played out over time with different material conditions in each given era and what led to what we have today. That's the simple version of historical materialism. It can even be more simply summed up with this quotation. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. That's from Upton Sinclair, the writer of The Jungle, a famous socialist writer and activist. And the idea here is that if a person's understanding depends on their livelihood, then the livelihood is going to inform the understanding rather than the other way around. Of course, that does happen. The internal world or the world of ideas will affect the material world to some degree. But the idea of materialism is that the physical conditions have a greater emphasis the other way around. That's the concept of material. But why are we talking about that in relationship to polyamory? For this, we're actually going to be focusing more on Frederick Engels, who doesn't get a whole lot of attention comparatively to Marx, which he was happy to be the, the background person in that regard. That's fine. Frederick Engels is also an amazing thinker in his own right and is often... Uh, thought of as writing more clearly and, and whose writing is more accessible than Marx, who for a variety of reasons, including trying to get around censors, is considered a lot less accessible and, and more dense. Taking a look then, what are the modes of production and the political economies of humanity over time? Marx and Engels called the initial way that humanity organized itself, which is to say hunter-gatherer tribal nations, they called that primary communism. 
And under primary communism, there was no private property. If you needed to build shelter, you could build shelter. If you needed to find food, you could find food. Of course, the forces behind like education and healthcare, those were collective group efforts. And in that way, being collective and group efforts, there was no private property around them. And that meant that you didn't need to figure out who owned what and, and have those clear delineations. The concept of the institution of marriage was not needed because the purpose of marriage was actually to inform property relations. But so in primary communism, group marriage was actually more common and societies were more commonly matrilineal, which is to say not only did you have men in relationships with multiple women, but you also had women in relationships with multiple men, and it was far more egalitarian. In fact, anthropologists and sociologists will use the phrase fierce egalitarianism, it wasn't simply a matter of everybody getting along and there being no problems, but to say that egalitarianism was enforced. If a tribal nation caught someone hoarding, that was severely treated. Different tribal nations had different ways of dealing with that, but it was treated as a very serious issue because they understood it to be a threat to the survival of the entire tribal nation and, and everyone as a people. And that's what they understood to work for living on earth. Evidence of that can be found in the fact that in just a few hundred years of private property and capitalism, we have plunged ourselves into a complete collapse of the biosphere, which that's a talk for another time, but maybe they were onto something with this idea that abolishing private property was the way to have life on earth. So that was primary communism. Frederick Engels divides uh, the eras of humanity and how we lived into three different categories, at least for the purpose of understanding the family relations. A lot of this, by the way, comes from Frederick Engels' book, The Origins of Family, the State, and Private Property. So we have primary communism, and then we get a shift toward capitalism. That's not to say that we have capitalism right away, but we have a capitalist shift in that direction through agricultural development. Now, why is that a shift toward capitalism? Because now there's an emphasis on who can do what with which land. Now that you have people intensively farming, or at least more intensively than they used to, because hunter-gatherers still grew food in their own ways as well. They just put far less emphasis on it. The agricultural revolution was not a revolution in the concept of farming, just in the emphasis that it got in a lifestyle. But because now there's more emphasis on, on farming, that means there needs to be more, more negotiation around that control, who can do what with which land. And that means there's more emphasis on borders. There's more emphasis on having the property and then passing it to other people. How, what can I do with this property includes being able to give it to other people. And now they have that power and negotiating that. And so we have a shift toward capitalism in agricultural development. And with that, we get what Frederick Engels calls pairing marriage, which is to say that you get a kind of institution of marriage, but it is still socially acceptable to have intimate and sexual relations with other people. The institution of the marriage is actually more about that property. It's more about saying, who am I going to share property with, but I can still have emotional and sexual relationships with others as well. And I'll explain the images a little bit. One of the big shifts toward capitalism in the agricultural development is that because some people were particularly emphasizing their work as farm workers, other people then freed up their time because they could count on those people to have food. And so now we have people who were working on things like making tools. And so now you have one person who has a lot of tools and no food, and then you have another person who has a lot of food but no tools, and now you need a system to trade. And that's where transactions and bartering become more emphasized, whereas before, under hunter-gatherer lifestyle, we had more of a gift economy. There was no need to trade because everything belonged to everyone. Whereas now, if I'm a farmer and I own the land, I don't want just people coming up and taking any food. I got to make sure that I'm getting something in return for all that work I'm doing that's now taking up a lot more of my time. But there's a lot of research on how hunter-gatherers had far more free time than we have today. Even peasants under feudalism have more uh, free time than most workers in the United States. All that is to say that with agricultural development, 
which didn't have to play out this way. I want to be clear, agriculture itself is not necessarily a capitalist institution, but the way that agricultural development happened, there was a lot of emphasis on who owned which land. And then also it created surpluses of one kind and lacks of another that then needed to be traded somehow. And so the more that that went on, the more there was a shift into the forces behind capitalism. And it wasn't until a full-fledged capitalism that we get the third and current stage of, of marriage that we have today. We've seen primary communism and group marriage and agricultural development and pairing marriage. And then Frederick Engels is emphasizing that with industrialism, we have the monogamous marriage. Now, this is interesting, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is that the same way that industrialism is a more concretely materialized manifesting and visioning of the agricultural development the same way monogamous marriage is more of a concrete manifestation of pairing marriage now this is part of that materialism thing right we can in theory have the same concept of pairing marriage today which is to say that we marry people based on our property interests but then can have emotional and sexual relationships with other people but the more that we invest in property the more that property interests define those relationships and that's that materialism component is that the physical conditions inform the way that we socially relate to each other and so when we get a full-blown industrialism that's where we see the rise of monogamous marriage under feudalism for example we had much more of the pairing marriage and much more freedom with emotional and sexual relationships. I think that all of this is neatly summed up with one quotation from one of the YouTube videos that I researched from, link available in the slides. The separation of family from the clan and the institution of monogamous marriage were the social expressions of developing private property. Now, realize here that when the family was living with the clan, that was when we had that collective attitude toward property, whereas now that we've separated the family from the clan, that's where private property becomes even more important. Once private property becomes even more important, once we keep investing in private property, now we need to separate the family from the clan so that we can keep those things ours. And this is, as Frederick Engels describes, the material foundation for the subjugation of women. Because now that we have the separation of the family from the clan. Now we no longer have such matrilineal group interests. Now we need someone else to be in charge of the family. And this happened to be, it could have played out other ways, but it happened to be the man in the household. And that's where capitalism becomes the material foundation for the patriarchy. And this quotation, by the way, comes from a video from Eleanor Leacock, a good video. Good resource. So that's the basis of the idea of how polyamory came out of the development of capitalism. Now, I want to be clear, all of this is to say that you can be a perfectly good anti-capitalist and still live monogamously. That's fine. This is just meant to introduce ideas that maybe have us thinking a little more critically of where our ideas are coming from. This gives us the tools to understand maybe all of my ideas come from independently thinking, but maybe some of them come from the culture around me and the concept of materialism or the material analysis is one of the ways that we can better understand which ideas are our own and which ideas come from society and the institutions that we are surrounded by. I'm going to take you now into the reflection questions. If we were doing this live, then we would be reflecting on these in conversation with each other. But for now, whatever way you want to think about these questions, whether that's journaling or going for a walk or just thinking about them on your couch or on your phone or whatever, I offer you these questions, which include with the first one, what forces have enacted on me to influence my own sexuality? So for you, maybe that is the force of capitalism in living monogamously. Maybe not. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's your sexual preferences. Maybe it is not ever considering the fact that you might not be heteronormative. And maybe that's something to think about. But there's a variety of ways that those forces can have happened. So I offer that question to you. The other question I leave you with is, what other sexualities might I consider as a conscious and mindful exploration? 
Now, I want to be clear here. I emphasize the conscious and mindful exploration, which is to say, be safe as well as honor your own needs. Go at a pace that you can navigate and manage and, and just take care of yourself and other people as you explore new relationships and ways to relate to other people. So I, I emphasize that safety and those might be other talks for other times. But I leave you with these questions and, and also this quotation from John Dewey, radical socialist educator who said, we don't just learn from experiences, we also learn from reflecting on the experience. So I ask you whatever experiences you have to be critically reflecting on them sometimes with that material analysis if you can. And then a quick walkthrough of the resources. On the left-hand side here, we have the usual stuff from uh, my sex bio, my own resources, uh, and some things on understanding political economy in general and how it relates to sexuality. And then we also have on the right side here, we have a couple different sources on that book by Engels, Origins of Family, Private Property, and the State. Really good stuff there. The concept of historical materialism, if that interests you, those are really good starter videos. And then I strongly emphasize these two videos on decolonizing relationships, both of which come from really rad indigenous activists who are thinking critically and asking us to think critically about the way we relate to ourselves, to others, especially in our intimate relationships. I strongly ask you to please check those ones out. And then more resources over here, just a couple breakdowns of uh, monogamy and marriage in general, coming from a couple sources like PBS. And then I especially emphasize the book Sex at Dawn. There's a couple great summary videos there. The book Sex at Dawn looks at the history of monogamy, again, with that understanding of how it relates to property, really good stuff. And then in that third section, you'll see the book Caliban and the Witch, excellent book. That book on fire podcast is an excellent resource to, to help walk you through that book as well. And then there's a podcast episode on uh, sex throughout history and, and just a more exploration of the ways that we used to relate to sex and how that has led to the ways that we relate to sex today. So thank you again. Do check out the other My Sex Bio videos, not just from me, but from the other people as well, and our own live workshops that you can sign up for, including fucking capitalism. But again, My Sex Bio offers really awesome stuff that I encourage you to check out. And until then, solidarity.